It's my pleasure today to introduce the speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Mike, Michael Nelson or Mike Nelson. Um, so he's a senior mining consultant at Stantec Inc. He was previously professor of mining engineering at the University of, U or sorry, University of Alaska Fairbanks and then University of Utah, um, where he was also the department chair for 11 years. Uh, he holds degrees in metallurgical engineering, applied physics and mining engineering. He is a registered member, fe member, fellow and distinguished member of the Society for Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration or SME. Mike contributed significantly to handbooks recently published or updated by SME as author or co-author of four chapters in the Mining Engineering Handbook from 2011, five in the SME Mineral Processing and Extractive Metallurgy Handbook from 2019, and two in the Underground Mining Handbook from 2023. He has co-authored or contributed to 11 additional books, and he has also prepared 37 uh, refereed, I think, publications relating to underground mining, mineral processing, mine health and safety, and mining education. Mine is, Mike has worked for Kennecott Copper, Westinghouse Electric, Consolidation Coal, and EI, EIMCO process equipment. He holds nine patents in mining and mineral processing technology and has given invited short courses in the USA, Australia, Ecuador, and India. He has served as a consultant and expert witness for 27 clients and as a director or advisor to several junior mining companies. And he is in the second year of a six year appointment as a member of the board of advisors for the Utah State Trust Lands Administration or CITLA. So help me welcome Mike here today. I'm a former student of his, so I'm really excited to see him here today. So let's give him a warm welcome and hear what he has to talk about. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. <clears throat> going to talk today about Park City Tunnels and the rehabilitation of the Daily Judge Tunnel <clears throat> for the uh, 2002 Winter Olympics. So I'm interested in Park City because my dad grew up there. His dad was an underground miner who always worked unless they were on strike or the price of silver was too low, which was often. But uh, <clears throat> my dad said that uh, he figured when he graduated from high school, he would go to work in the mines like everybody else did. But his mom had a different idea. She talked to the super and told him that her son was going to college. And uh, so when he went to apply for a job, the super told him, uh, you're going to college, huh? I like that. And he said, oh yeah, I'm going to college. <laughs> and super said, uh, anytime you come home from college, if you've got time to work a shift, you can work a shift and I'll pay you for it. So for the first two years, he went to BYU. <clears throat> he was coming home every weekend. He said, if you did it right, you could get four shifts in, in a weekend. <laughs> and, you know, that's how it was. And he says, and I was, this was after World War II. He said, so there are a lot of older guys there, and a lot of them are, were returned Mormon missionaries, and they were convinced I was going to Park City and partying all weekend. <laughs> so they made it their goal in life to convert me. And he says, I didn't tell them any different. <laughs> So uh, my dad became a high school band teacher. So, but he always told us about things that happened underground. It was real interesting to me. So uh, <clears throat> just uh, to lead off here, this is a picture in the uh, um, Ontario number two drain tunnel. A lot of old timers call it the Keatley Tunnel. But uh, some of you might recognize Bill Perry there on the left. He was a geology professor. And this time, uh, Sandy City asked us to go on a look at the tunnel and see if it would be a reliable source for them to get some water from. So <clears throat> probably most of you are familiar, Park City was a big mining district, produced over 5 billion tons in lead, zinc, silver, gold ores, and there were a lot of mines operated in there in that area between 1869 and 1992. The mines were always wet, you know. Every time you see a Park City miner, you think you might be looking at a a fisherman, right, with his yellow slicker and his Norwester on. But it was a problem because, you know, you, many of you know the geology better than I do. It's in a big, messed up, shared zone, you know, just room for a lot of water. So uh, they always uh, had a problem handling water. And uh, <clears throat> talk first about the Ontario number one drain tunnel and then number two, but they uh, developed number one tunnel in 1881 down to the 600 foot level. When I talk about that, that's the distance below the surface in most underground mines, the 600 level. And uh, <clears throat> it cost at that time $200,000, which was equivalent to 5 million. 1883, they installed a Cornish pump on the surface. Now this pump cost, you can see the numbers there, $17 million equivalent. 
of the building. It was the biggest one in the world. The flywheel was 30 feet in diameter. It was cast iron, cast in eight sections in San Francisco and hauled up to the Ontario with, with the horse teams. I didn't put a picture in, but if you go to the Park City Museum, you can see a picture of a, a team of 20 horses. I'm pulling a number four Studebaker freight wagon up the hill. You see that uh, walking alongside, they alternate their ostlers walking along each by each pair of horses just to keep them working together. It was a real skill. So uh, um, the uh, pipe was 20 inches in diameter and it was a lifting pipe, kind of like in an old hand pump. It would drop down. Then as it pulled up, the valves would col close. They called them the clackers, right? And that would lift the water up and dump it. So I had a 10 foot stroke and it could uh, lift 320 gallons of water on each stroke. So uh, I got to see a Cornish pump work in, in Cornwall. It's just a demonstration, but that big wheel goes around and the rod just goes up and down, you know. Uh, the pump rod was 1,060 feet long, 16 inch square pine from Oregon. How do you get a, a piece of pine that long? Answer, you get a bunch of short pieces and you hook them together with steel straps and bolts, right? And uh, lifted 2,560 gallons a minute. You can see the numbers there. It was really something but it didn't last look these are there we go there's a picture of the pump you can see the size of the flywheel there the idea was that slow moving coal engine just kept that big flywheel turning and once it got going there was just enough inertia to keep lifting the water i found out in cornwall that uh, the original cornish pumps the valves on the rod were made out of hippopotamus hide and they found out that lasted the longest and provided the best isolation. You know, and you think this was in the 1700s. They didn't have vulcanized rubber. So there were a lot of tunnels built in Park City. <clears throat> and some of them, you know, they didn't even survive with the name. But the ones that are known now is the, the number one tunnel. And I won't read you all these numbers. The Daily Judge, the Ontario number two, <clears throat> the Alliance, and the Spiro, and the Snake Creek Tunnel. So today we're going to talk about first uh, the Ontario number two tunnel. So that tunnel was driven because they put in the pump that raised all the water up to the 600 foot level where the number one tunnel was and then it could drain out. But they were burning about 30 tons of coal a day. Okay. Which is kind of go, where did that come from? Coalville, right? Of course. And so they had, but it was expensive and they couldn't keep up with it. So they, uh, they decided to uh, put in another tunnel. This tunnel was going to be nine feet high, four feet wide at the top, and five at the bottom, with a 10-inch ditch. <clears throat> they used 10-inch timbers, a plank floor with 18-pound rail. That means it weighed 18 pounds per foot, right? You know, And <clears throat> it's still in use, as you'll hear. And the east flank ore bodies that it opened up produced uh, uh, more than 450 tons a day, even into the 60s. So what does the timber for a tunnel look like? If you go online, you can find a PDF version of Peel's handbook now. It tells you a lot of interesting things. This is he, how uh, Peel showed the timbering for a drainage tunnel. And you can see uh, the posts are on the sides, right? There's a cap on the top, and those are hitched together with uh, little pieces of wood called girts, right? Cornish word. And then on the sides of the post and across the top is what they call the lagging. My grandpa called it lagging. 1948, when the snow was so deep, Park City, he just brought home lagging from the mine and put it over the tunnel that went to his house up on Ontario Avenue. <laughs> so <clears throat> so uh, it's interesting, though, to think of this. Um, a, a 10 by 10 foot inch by 9 foot long post weighs 212 pounds. Okay? The caps weighed 170 pounds each, and each piece of lagging weighed 106 pounds. So they had a little bobcat with a forklift on it to handle all these timbers? No. How did they handle it? You know, how do you how do you lift a 170-pound cap up to the top? <clears throat> the answer is it was hard work, right? And but mostly what they would do is when they'd blast the round for the tunnel, they wouldn't muck it out all the way down to the floor. They'd leave a bunch of muck in there so they could stand on that while they set the timbers. You know? And <clears throat> miners were clever handling timbers. This is from Butte. They had a special 
uh, square set stoping method there where it looks almost like Lincoln logs, right? But you can see this miner can move a big timber, how? By hooking into it with a pick and then drag it along the floor, right? So it's hard work. <clears throat> Uh, the Ontario Tunnel has one interesting thing. I've only ever seen it in the Ontario. Uh, you can see here, I don't know, can you see my cursor? Yes. All right, so um, there's a post, right, and the lagging is back, but between the post and the lagging, they put these little tapered two by two inch blocks, okay? And those are designed so as the lagging takes load, those little blocks will fail, right? I mean, it's what a rock mechanics now is called preliminary stress relief, right? You relieve some of the stress and that gives you more time. But you know, think of think of the hand labor that went into putting that in there, right? Okay. The other thing is that uh, <clears throat> I'm not a mycologist by any means, but I could visually identify over 20 different kinds of fungi in the Ontario mine. Little mushrooms and big puffy stuff. And and the miner that was took us in, he said, Don't touch that stuff, it burns your hands. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> so <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of the timbers that went into the mines in the West, this is in Virginia City, or I guess in Carson City, the railroad terminal. But that's all timber that was going into mines in the Virginia City, Silver City Mining District. And uh, pretty much cut bare the western slope of the Sierras for a long ways to timber those mines. So um, it, researching the driving of these tunnels, the, the park record and a lot of newspapers have now been scanned and they're all online. So if you have the patience and you go to the park record and pick 10 years and enter Ontario Tunnel, it'll give you everything that talks about the tunnel. And you find some interesting stuff, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting stuff in the park record. But related to the Ontario Tunnel, um, I just extracted some uh, vignettes from the park record to give you an idea of what they had. Uh, January 23rd, 1894, said bad ground at the tunnel, advancing 23 feet a week. Okay. Um, March 10th, 12 men working full time to keep 150 feet of ground open. That means they had driven the tunnel 150 feet, but everything was still moving. So they had to keep mucking it back and shipping it out. April 21st, no work at the face. A stream of water the size of a man's body has the force of a fire hose. So they had opened up an area where the ground was weak enough to let that ground water up. Um, same time, the crews are working to retimber the worst 600 feet of tunnel using 18 inch diameter rounds brought in from Oregon. So uh, I don't know if they did a cost benefit analysis on this or not, but there's money being spent. May 4th, they got all this ground under control, went back to work at the face. Water pressure decreased. Pumping was decreased by over 1.7 million gallons a day to 1,200 gallons a minute. High water levels in the tunnel limited the haulage. They were hauling the uh, muck out in cars that were pulled by mules or horses. And uh, when the water at times would get so deep, that each mule could only pull two cars a day because of the resistance of moving through the water and pulling the car. When there was no water, a mule could pull 15 cars. The, uh, the editor of the record always said, talks about himself as the man from the record, right? He reported the tunnels in 11,000, 30 feet with 900 feet left to the number three shaft. That's where it would join up with the shafts. Daylight was visible from the face. It was pointed out that Mr. Keatley, the super, has his own method for maintaining alignment. I went to the back of this, and you can see the mouth from the back, okay? They probably had a total station to do that, right? No, not even a transit, okay? And you'll see this, you know, things in here like... Uh, Crews at the Ontario were busy on the day shift, dropping the level of the floor one inch on the northern end. Okay, so they had to not only keep it straight, but keep the alignment so the water would flow out of it. So the, the superintendent was in there every day. Jack, he says, no, boys, you're going up, you know. When you think of the tools they had to work with and to be able to do it that accurately, it's pretty amazing. 1894, bad ground again, <laughs> July 7th. Report of a baseball game at the tunnel grounds. That became the town of Keatley. Baseball was a big deal in Park City. Um, I know my grandfather all talked about how much he liked the 4th of July because he could play in a baseball game. Um, July 14th, it took him four days to control 40 feet of tunnel. 
July 28th, they had a new schoolhouse, had a dance. <laughs> August 4th, nearing the end, they let 11 timbermen go. This was the other interesting thing, you know. You might work four or five, six years timbering this town. When they're done, they say, find another job. They don't, we don't need any more timbermen here. Uh, September 8th, 400 feet left, but now in hard ground. Each round requires 12 to 30 hours of drilling. And the drills hitch in the holes. They'll get stuck, you know, because a piece of rock comes off. So that's another kind of hard work. What's bad ground? Well, I'll just do a little more detail on that. <laughs> One place the ground was so bad it required two months hard labor night and day with power drills and a resort to an entirely new method of driving spiling and breast boarding to get one set of timbers. Cost the company $3,500 per foot, which is equivalent to $87,000 today, right? So <clears throat> what are they talking about spiling? I didn't know about this for a long time, but uh, this is a way to support your excavation ahead of the timbers. You can imagine how timbers would work. You know, they take the weight almost vertically. But after you blast around, there's a bunch of unsupported ground out there. So what they would do, and you can see it illustrated really nicely. You can also get this book online. It was written by a, a professor at the uh, uh, University of Idaho when they had a mining department. It's got beautiful hand-drawn illustrations in it. So you can see top left there, they've got three sets of posts in place. But as they, as they put those in place, they also put a collar brace between the last two, and then they drive what's called a spile ahead. Spile is usually a piece of lagging two by, um, two by six or two by eight and six or eight feet long. And they, in the carpenter shop, they taper the edge of it, and then they put an iron shoe on it, and they drive this ahead of the face with the drill, right? In the old days, they do it with sledgehammers, but the drill is a lot faster. So that takes that, that load that's developing in the open area and cantilevers it back onto the supports that are already in place. Does that make sense? Pretty clever when you think about it, right? And, uh, you know, there are a lot of intricacies to this, but you can see down lower, um, they sometimes they use spiles on the sides as well, because where you've got this squeezing ground, it's not just, you know, it's trying to come in everywhere. And sometimes they put in what were called breast boards. You can see those in the bottom right where they put in temporary boards and put a sprag in there to hold it as they remove the muck. Okay. Now, I haven't seen reference to this anywhere else, but there was discussion in the park record of using uh, large amounts of hay uh, between the last uh, uh, support and the face. And I thought about that. Hay would also be a yielding medium, right? It would, as the ground flowed and moved forward, the hay would compress up to a certain point, but it would stay open, right? And, they, you know, when they're done, they could put it back in the ditch and it would float out to my, where the horse is, I guess, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you get the idea that there's some real ingenuity here, but also just learning to work with what you've got. So the spiles were made from timber capped with iron. Large sacks of hay were placed in front of the breast boards and thoroughly packed before the ground could be held at all. So that ground was just moving all the time. And often as much as 40 or 50 cars of sand and gravel escaped through a crevice that was not large enough to admit the passage of a man's hand. Okay. So again, you know, as you, as you think about, you know, this big event that put all this ore in place years ago, it really tore things up. And now we're going to go start poking around in there. I remember um, we went in the the uh, Ontario Tunnel on a Friday and then back on a Monday. We went past a spot where you could see there was a fault there and it had about maybe six inches of gouge between the two levels of the fault. And, and uh, the man that took us in said, he says, yeah, we have to always watch this area. On Monday when we went back in, that gouge had flowed out almost halfway across the tracks. It was like somebody squeezed toothpaste out of it. <laughs> and then, you know, you really get the sense that uh, this is still happening. Right? So, so uh, in this particular instance, uh, two circular drifts were run for the purpose of drawing the water, sand, and gravel from the face. It was ineffectual until it was discovered that the water almost invariably gravitated to the point where the operations were being carried on. <laughs> then by boring, the breast boards in the side drifts full of holes and keeping men constantly with work at bars, 
with bars to keep the holes open, the pace was finally advanced beyond the point of difficulty. There were six such spots encountered within a distance of 700 feet. Now the Ontario uh, tunnel was completed in I believe 1894. I can't remember the dates on all this, but a couple of years later, they had a big ground fault, the number nine fault. And the, they knew there was a problem there, but they had a big ground fall and it closed the tunnel. And the water was backing up in the shaft, right? So now you've got the tunnels closed. You've got 600 feet of water in the shaft. How many PSI is 600 feet of water? It's a lot, right? <clears throat> so um, they put in this um, support. This is 12 inch iron pipe filled with concrete. And this is a picture that I took. And then they installed a door made of timbers, four by four inch timbers on that. And what they would do, first they mucked out the area that caved in. They got this set and controlled. And they would go into the face, drill around and set it. By this time they had Bickford fuses, so they knew how long the fuse would burn. But the guy said, we'd light the fuse and run like hell. Okay, and these doors were designed with a space over the top. So after the round blasted, they go and start mucking it out and then they see, is there any water coming over the top? All right, you see how, <laughs> any volunteers? Okay. So, <clears throat> but they were able to get it mucked out. And I don't know the chronology, but you can see on the top right here, here's one of those pipes. Here's another 12 inch pipe filled with concrete. What's the compressive strength of concrete? Yeah, there was a lot of weight being carried there, okay. Um, so let's now talk about the Daily Judge Tunnel. Uh, the Daily Judge Tunnel was also put in for development. And you can see here on good old Google Maps, um, it was started over here, uh, kind of on the Park City side, Park City's down there, a little further off the screen. And then it, oops. It runs under the mountains between Empire and Ontario Canyons, and it comes out just a little bit down the road from the old Ontario mine office that's up there on the, as you start to go over Garden Way. And uh, it was a, a much smaller tunnel, uh, easier to develop, and uh, the drills were better by then. So, um, so they could advance pretty regularly 15 feet a day. I remember one time they spent three weeks going 23 feet, right? So it cost $200,000. I didn't scale that up to modern value, but uh, it was later extended, had a lot of branches put on it because once you get something like this, you know, you can use it to move water from all over. There are a lot of, uh, it goes near the Daily West and the Judge Number 2 shaft so they could connect to it there and a lot of side drifts and ore shoots and winds and it does go through two major faults. So <clears throat> um, this, uh, the Judge, the Daily Judge Tunnel, and the Spiro Tunnel are two of the main sources of Park City's drinking water. Right? And uh, the water that comes out of these tunnels nominally is crystal clear and pure. It meets any drinking water standards, you know, from any state or the EPA. But when there's a ground fall and it stirs up dust, you know, what do you expect in the dust in a lead zinc silver mine? All right, volatile metals, right? Okay, and so then, what they were doing when that would happen, they would just divert the flow of that tunnel into the surface water until it cleared up again. Concern was, we're gonna have the Olympics here, we have how many people, and we're gonna have to provide them with regular flow of water. So um, they asked me and Ben Sigmiller, some of you may know Ben, I think he's pretty well retired now, he's a mining engineer as well, and they asked us to take a look at it. First thing I saw when we went in was a nice hand painted sign <laughs> to remind the workers mm. yeah, to uh, keep the water clean. So in the fall 2001, uh, uh, we went in to look at this tunnel and as I pretty much described it to you, but the, the city uh, knew that the timber sets were deteriorating. Okay? And this is just uh, plain raw timber that was put in there um, one time they'd coat the timber with creosote, they didn't do that. And, you know, then there was, there are other ways to preserve timber, but this was just raw timber and uh, they wanted to take a look at it. 
So you can see there, uh, that's the old uh, uh, Daily Judge Mine office. If you can, you can pretty much drive in there unless there's somebody from Talisker messing around in the old buildings up there. You can see it. And uh, standing there, it's uh, um, two of the miners and then my dad who remembered going that tunnel when he was a boy. So we contracted to inspect the tunnel, document the conditions there, recommend corrections, recommend a contractor to do the work and monitor the construction. So uh, we essentially, we had a map of the tunnel and we went in and just looked at the condition of the timbers all along through it. You can see we didn't go off in all the side drifts, but uh, <clears throat> using this highly sophisticated mapping method, we uh, identified the potential life of the uh, timbers. And our methods were pretty much uh, observation and management, right? This was the observation. We had some pretty sophisticated devices for uh, assessing the quality of the timbers. This is called a, a metallic timber probe. Okay. Um, it's manually operated, okay, but uh, the idea was if that screwdriver blade went further than two inches into the timber, was probably going to need to be replaced in the, in the next 10 years. <clears throat> we saw some interesting stuff. We identified that 69 timber sets were failing. And uh, you can see, <laughs> you know, this is a 10 by 10 inch timber. And it's just going, <clears throat> right. So uh, <clears throat> we also estimated that there were 102 yards of muck that would have to be removed. Let me just go back to one slide. Sorry, there it was. Yeah. So um, this tunnel was a little different than the one shown in Peel's ditch. Remember, he showed a water ditch, but then the timbers were right on the, the ground. Uh, because um, these tunnels carried so much water, they drove them with a separate water ditch below the level of the rails. You see how they did that? I mentioned that to my dad, and he said, oh, that's what we always called the piss ditch, okay. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Okay, so, um, so that's the type of tunnel we're looking at. And the decision was made to uh, replace these timber sets with, with steel sets. Okay. And there was uh, you know, a lot of calculation went into saying, well, if a 10 by 10 inch red pine timber did the job, what size of an I-beam does it take to, to provide the same level of safety? And uh, calculated that and, and came up with uh, um, the post and cap were six by 15 and others were six by 25. But basically we could do all this with steel. This was nice because this could all be cut and pre-measured on the surface then just taken in and installed. And uh, <clears throat> we select a contractor. It was a, a company called Miners Inc. They're not in business anymore, but for years they did contract mining operations all over the country. I don't know if any of you know uh, uh, Gary Stubblefield. Anybody old enough to remember him? He was long for a long time was the, the CEO at Norwest Mining, but his brother John was the head miner for Miners Inc. They grew up in the Tintic district, and John told me that he was dyslexic. He said, "He said I could never figure out how that worked." He said, "When I was in the fourth grade, the teacher stayed two hours after every day of class and taught me how to read," <laughs> which I thought was an interesting story. You know, so he was managing it, and uh, you know they gave us a nice estimate how much it would cost and so on, and and. Uh, uh, we recommended going ahead with it. You can see him again there. Um, <clears throat> that's my dad on the left. He was real excited to go in here. Um, that's uh, John Stubblefield in the middle. I asked him where he was going to go after we finished this job. And he said, oh, I'm going down to that salt mine in Louisiana. They have me install all the roof bol bolts that are higher than 80 feet. He said, how do you do that? He says, a big ass cherry picker. <laughs> he said, the trouble is, you get up that high and you can only put in one bolt. Then you got to, because you know, you're not going to take that 80 foot cherry picker. And, you know. So I said, we charge by the hour and make a lot of money. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's interesting here though, just I put this in again because you can see the building. <clears throat> Here's a picture of that same building in I think 1928. Looks about the same, right? Steps are a little bit different. You can also see that uh, now the entry to the tunnel is open. Uh, earlier on, <clears throat> They, uh, they had a building over it. 
my dad said that uh, um, they had that heated so the miners could kind of dry off before they left for home. An interesting story my dad told me after we got back from there, he said, you know, I remember going to that building with your grandpa when I was a boy. He said, uh, they had advertised they needed four miners. And there was, we got up there at seven in the morning and there was a big line of men lined up at the door and the super was on the porch and every man would walk up and stand there and the super would either go, that was no or not, that was yes. So what were they judging on? You know, how many hard eight hour shifts can this guy put in, right? That was the only criterion. <clears throat> so we came in on time under budget, put in 83 steel sets, uh, over 4,000 square feet of lagging, uh, removed the muck and cleaned and deepened the, the water ditch. This is just uh, looking down <clears throat> on, the, on the train going in, you can see there's always water in there, right? Always flowing out. A couple of other interesting notes. <clears throat> Um, that's the end of the story on the Daily Dutch Tunnel, right? Still there, as I say, if, uh, you can probably drive up there because Talisker is not too much interested in it anymore. Um, <clears throat> you've also maybe heard of the Spiro Tunnel. This used to be called the Ski Tunnel, right? In the old days in Park City, uh, Spiro, Spiro's name's on a lot of things. There's a Spiro Tunnel in Nevada and there's Spiro workings in, in uh, Leadville. But uh, he was convinced that if they drove a tunnel in from here, and this is down uh, before you even get into Park City. They go back and intersect the Silver King ore body. He had enough money to finance that, put in the tunnel, but uh, it, it, they never hit any pay, right? But in the 60s, somebody got the idea that they could run skiers in a train into this tunnel to the back, and they could get on the hoist and ride up to the top and ski down. I see Paul nodding his head. Did you do that, Paul? Yeah, well, it was a big deal, you know. And uh, so the city called me again in 2014, I believe it was. So we'd like you to take a look at the Spiro Tunnel um, because uh, <clears throat> their water treatment plant is just downstream of there. And there's, there's no protection, right, if something went wrong, plus a lot of condominiums and businesses. So this is what it looked like at that time. They had a gate on it and it was pretty secure, but uh, <clears throat> they wanted to know, you know, uh, what's the likelihood that this tunnel's going to fail? And we got in there, and it's all, you know, and they have, a, at that time, they had a crew of, I think, five miners working in there every day just to keep it going. And they were concerned about contamination to the water, mainly the same sort of thing. But we got back into one area that was soft ground, and they had bolted it with rock bolts, with uh, split-set rock bolts, which are friction. And they... Uh, they put up chain link, and then about every six inches, they put a rock bolt to hold that chain link in place. And that chain link looked like the buttons on a fat man's shirt. You know, it was just, and so, and, and uh, th they weren't too happy with our report because we said, uh, you know, a large cave in um, that would block the tunnel is unlikely, but there are areas in there that could fail almost immediately. Now, um, the city has since uh, completely rebuilt the Sparrow Tunnel. This was done by a contractor called Frontier Kemper. Uh, the city paid six and a half million dollars to have them do that. I haven't been in it, but they also redid the water treatment plant to where their water treatment plant is now, to my knowledge, really state of the art. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, the city has, um, Park City Water District has done a good job taking care of these resources. Regarding the Ontario Tunnel, <clears throat> you know, it's a, if you're familiar with it, it comes out right almost on the level of the Jordan L Reservoir, right? And people often ask me, are there ever going to be any mines in Park City again? And what do you think the answer is? Not likely, right? Okay, why not? Well, one, rich people love to live in an old mining town. They don't like to live in current mining towns, right? Okay. Um, and everybody loves to live in an old mining town, right? It's picturesque. It has atmosphere. So that's one reason. <clears throat> the other reason is that uh, <clears throat> with, when the reservoir was built, you know, now you know the water is up to that level. And uh, 
you know, when the mine shut down, they had mined down to as far as that Ontario tunnel would drain it. So if you're going to go mining down there some more, you got to have some big pumps or drive another tunnel, right? And then you have to go through all the permitting and everything else. So it's not likely. This is what the new water treatment plant looks like. And uh, it's interesting to go out to that area because uh, the city has also restored a lot of the old uh, Silver King mines buildings there, the, the boiler house and the office and everything. Take a look at them. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions.